So Roseanne had a TV show back for all of a day and a half, and she managed to say something stupid and get everybody to freak the hell out, surprising apparently a lot of you, which is kind of surprising to me because I didn't think it was that far back in the past for everyone to forget that the reason Roseanne the TV show went off the air the first time was because Roseanne the person is a crazy person who was impossible to work with, alienated everyone around her, got too much control of the production, and drove what had been one of the most popular TV series of all time into a ditch in what turned out to be one of the most notoriously terrible final seasons ever produced. Oh wow, what happened? Now granted, TV personalities having controversial public or private lives that play at odds with their on-air personas is nothing new. Kelsey Grammer was a paradoxically hard-partying conservative Republican notorious for suspicious high-speed crashes and much younger girlfriends when he was playing a dry-witted intellectual on Frasier. Tim Allen did time for drug dealing back in the day. Bill Cosby did all that stuff, if yeah. And apparently Chloe from Smallville is like running a sex trafficking cult. What the hell is going on out there? But the reason this is getting play at all is that Roseanne in real life is one of the few sort of still employable celebrities openly supportive of somehow still President Trump, and since Roseanne the show was always supposed to be about working class white people and how hard they supposedly have it because pop culture left them behind and boo hoo hoo, they decided that should be what the rebooted version of the show was about now as well. TV Roseanne will be one of those people who voted for Trump because she was angry about jobs or whatever and the rest of the family is varying levels of horrified about it, but ultimately they all still love each other because politics being this far away Washington stuff that doesn't really matter in the immediate real world is the fantasy that white families are going to need to tell themselves to avoid killing each other whenever this idiocy is all over. And you know, fine, whatever. Someone was going to do basically this premise as a show and pitch it as All in the Family 2018, which it totally isn't, no matter what, and doing it as the Roseanne reboot at least means John Goodman gets a big payday for once, and who doesn't want John Goodman to get a big payday? Seriously, though, he's earned it. How come this dude isn't in one of the Marvel things yet? He's one of our best actors, he's been good with Disney for years. He, if anyone, deserves to get an easy couple million in some merchandising royalties to show up and play like, I don't know, the Living Tribunal or some bullshit? Whatever. And it's not like ABC didn't know Roseanne was going to be a pain in the ass going in, they probably just figured she, of all people, would want that giant nostalgia payday the same as everyone else and would keep her mouth shut to make sure she'd get it. Apparently not. But what people didn't seem to count on is that despite the way people like to remember it, what caused the series to implode last time wasn't that Roseanne, the actual person, got super duper extreme political in the exact opposite direction from where she is now, which is this whole other thing, and then redirected that into the show, but that she did so in a way that made the show largely unrelatable. Characters changed on a dime, they junked the traditional Thanksgiving episode for a weird, ranty Pilgrims and Indians flashback, they did an episode-length parody of Under Siege 2 Dark Territory, complete with Steven Seagal cameo. It was a mess. And while the new Roseanne, or rather the one episode they've managed to air so far, aimed to get the topical elephant in the room out into the open in a relatable, milquetoast, network sitcom way that was about as agreeable as these things are generally gonna get, I guess, the problem for ABC is that the real-life Roseanne isn't controversial by virtue of being a working-class person who supports a divisive Republican president because he made vaguely human-sounded honking noises about jobs in front of large flags and farm equipment like on the show. As in her previous life, it's because she's off on the extreme fringe of her particular political side. Specifically, her social media feed, which is starting to seem like a resource some famous people just shouldn't use as it relates to the Commander-in-Chief, is often devoted to proselytizing about QAnon, which I honestly hope most of you lead happy, fulfilling enough lives to have never needed to hear about, but for the record, is a batshit internet conspiracy theory hatched in the bowels of the various chans, which claims President Trump's tenure has actually been so chaotic, not because he doesn't know what he's doing, but because he's secretly waging a nearly one-man covert war against an international satanic pedophilia cult that secretly controls the U.S. government, involves pretty much any politician who thinks there should be a government, funny how that works out, and is of course a secret New World Order Zionist plot masterminded, depending on who you ask and what time of day it is, either by George Soros, who is in fact a real guy, not someone your unstable uncle made up on Facebook, he's just some rich guy who donates money to political stuff, or an ancient secret race of non-human overlords colloquially referred to as reptilians or the reptoids, or maybe they're one and the same. And before you laugh this off, remember, enough idiots believe in this bullshit that some guy shot up a pizza parlor because the internet told him Hillary Clinton had a secret child sacrifice altar in a basement that doesn't exist. Yeah, this is a part of that. And you wonder why I leave the Illuminati parody up at the front of this show, other than the fact that conspiracy theories are a psychological defense reflex for the weak-minded and intellectually mediocre to guard against having to acknowledge that we exist in a chaotic and amoral universe where bad things can and in fact do happen for absolutely no reason, justice is entirely in our own hands, and nobody's hand is on the steering wheel, and thus the type of people who believe in conspiracy theories deserve to be made fun of, mocked and shamed to the point of near total ban <laughs> from polite modern society. <clears throat> but 
anyway, the debut of the series before this latest nonsense got big enough ratings for ABC that they renewed it already, and even before the first episode aired, they were tripping over themselves to reassure everybody that not every episode would be about this, and it wasn't really going to be a political show, since the old version wasn't either, and you know, that's fine. A certain stripe of middle America wanting to indulge in a much more pleasant than reality fantasy about itself in the form of a sitcom is hardly the worst thing in the world, whether you're going to watch it or not. And speaking for myself, I don't know, I kind of find the idea that things never even got a little better for the Connors in like 20 years to be so depressing, I can't really laugh that much at it. I mean, at least with like Fuller House, you kind of have to assume they've mostly been on the upswing given they're still able to live in San Francisco, but you have to figure anyone at ABC with a real sense of their own network history is feeling a little bit deja vu right now. Whoever else she may be, Roseanne Barr was never reputed to be some kind of a astute socio-political commentator, she's an incredibly talented comedian, but also clearly a very long-term troubled person who probably never got the help she clearly needs. And if that does blow this whole project up prematurely for the second time, and to be clear, I don't think it's going to because I have to assume someone planned for this eventuality, that'll be really too bad because I know a lot of people who were excited for this show to come back did tune in and mostly enjoyed it. And the ratings do reflect, duh, that there is in fact an audience for a sympathetic depiction of middle American everyday life that doesn't depict its characters as caricatures or or cautionary tales. Or, you know, it could also just be that whatever audience is still there for watching network TV as opposed to literally anything else mainly just wants to see new episodes of whatever they were watching 20 years ago, but let's give it the benefit of the doubt for now. Regardless, it's a pretty shitty world out there, and everyone deserves at least a show they'd like to watch. Either way, those people didn't tune in for Twitter fights and harassing those school shooting kids. Yeah, she also did that. And insane world domination lizard people child trafficking conspiracies, just as the original series viewers weren't tuning in for Steven Seagal's spoofs or that weird alternate timeline thing in the last episode. So it should be interesting to see if they actually can hold the production together in spite of its troubled star this time. Because if not, I don't think Ashton Kutcher can come in and save this one. Although, maybe Ted McGinley is available? <laughs>Okay, so now that I've had some time to think on a little bit more, and now that the show has aired another episode, and thus is not showing anything much like evidence that there's much going on under the hood of the new Roseanne, beyond the immediate appeal to 90s nostalgia and some glancing at topical humor, I think some of the problem might be, at least coming from my own perspective, that they're trying to solve a problem that didn't really exist, namely the lack of supposed perspective from quote-unquote working-class white people on American television. Now that's kind of a loaded statement to begin with, because speaking on behalf of my own thoroughly ridiculous people, white America has or tends to have a really piss-poor sense of class, in as much as fairly rich white folks will still call themselves middle class if they aren't like king of the universe rich. Seriously, if you don't live here, this is a thing you have to understand about Americans. Giant ass house, four cars, we don't necessarily think of that as rich because we know there are people in the world who own like entire countries or even just five cars, so that to us is rich, and if you're not that rich, you must be something else. Likewise, poor white Americans are generally encouraged not to see themselves as poor because, you know, they've still got white going for them, and I mean, sure, it varies from region to region, but if nothing else, that whole cops will find excuses and not to arrest you thing, that comes in handy. Basically, if you want to understand the American psyche, just keep in mind that the guy who owns a quote-unquote small business and the guy who works minimum wage at the quote-unquote small business are both likely to refer to themselves as middle class if asked in certain situations. So when people say that working class white people haven't been properly represented on TV and cite Roseanne 2.0 as a corrective example, what they really mean is that it's been a while since there was a sitcom where performatively poor white people with non-coastal regional accents were the good guys, which is technically true. I mean, how long ago did My Name is Earl and or Raising Hope go off the air? I mean, yeah, it's been a while, fair's fair. But as naming those two shows demonstrates, there have been successors already to the original Roseanne. It's not like that that one show went away 20 years ago, and suddenly sitcoms were nothing but Will and & Grace and Seinfeld up until right now. In fact, there have been plenty, probably the most noteworthy being King of the Hill, which not only starred and was about the American white working class, but was sent in the heart of fucking Texas of all places, straight through the tail end of the Clinton years and right up through the early Bush 2 years, and I don't think this was really appreciated, since so much of the hype of it framed it as the successor show to Beavis and Butthead because of Mike Judge being the creator, and didn't really pay attention to King of the Hill probably being the logical successor to Roseanne in terms of the grand arc of television history. I'm almost tempted to say that I'd rather have King of the Hill make a comeback, but you know, I, I just don't think I really want it to without Luann, and it's just too much of a reminder of how much we lost with Brittany Murphy dying young, and as much as it would be nice to, you know, reconnect and find out how things worked out for Bobby, I think I'm okay leaving that where it left off, and wow, you know, come to think of it, we lost both Luann and Lucky now, and wow, that really sucks. Where does the time go, right?
But, you know, thinking on it, when it comes to the subject of animated shows, it occurs to me that people really are sincerely and honestly looking for a series that gives an honest and thoughtful, non caricatured take on the day-to-day -day lives of a working-class white family in the present-day United States. It's not a revival of a dated sitcom from the 90s, or even an occasionally ahead-of-its-time show from the turn of the century that would probably be the best example. The best example I could think of would be Bob's Burgers. Now, yes, fans of this series know I'll stand for Bob's Burgers in almost any context. I think it's one of the best shows on TV. It might be the best overall animated sitcoms on networks right now, if not the best sitcom period, but in spite of, or perhaps because it's a series that isn't generally about anything explicitly political, it wasn't until I started thinking on the matter and seeing other people point this out on social media that it really clicked for me that a lot of the supposedly vital discourse about the trials and troubles of the so-called white working class that Roseanne is getting so much credit for gesturing in the direction of, basically only through the novelty of its main character not apologizing for being a Trumper and, you know, the real-life person being an attention-hogging narcissistic lunatic in reality, is in fact being handled much better by the Belcher family week to week. Now, granted, when Bob's Burgers does decide to have something to say in the form of an issue episode, it almost invariably comes down on the so-called socially liberal side. That's not unusual in and of itself. In a modern-day sitcom, the year is 2018, that's generally where the mainstream discourse tends to land. Even Roseanne 2.0 knows that Trump's supporting star or not, it's not going to fly to have a main character not be supportive of the gender-fluid grandson or the black-in-law or any of the other look-see, we're-not-sexist or racist characters that have been added to the series. And Bob's Burgers is a similarly out-and-proud, diverse, inclusive, pro-gay, pro-trans, let's-all-get-along show in that mildly self-congratulatory mainstream network sitcom kind of way. But the day-to-day -day story does not shy away from the fact that the Belcher family are a working-class white family and are not exactly having the easiest time of things in their own economically depressed town. They struggle to get by. They never seem to have enough money. They don't seem to have the fanciest restaurant, the nicest things, the newest clothes, or the tidiest house. And the awkward, uncomfortable nuances of navigating the misshapen class structures of their own community often fuel some of the memorable storylines, particularly as it regards the kids, Tina, Louise, and Jean's attempts to fit in with their more often well-off classmates, like the trick-or-treating episodes, or especially any of the shows dealing with school dances or vacations, anything like that. And in this context, it's worth noting that since the show right down to its title is about the running of a small business, its economic politics are significantly more nuanced. Bob's nemesis Jimmy Pesto is a fellow small businessman whose villainy very often takes the form of excessive capitalism and corner-cutting cheat to win greed, but the show also doesn't make a total villain out of Mr. Fishoder, the local eccentric millionaire who owns everything and can pretty much decide Bob and Jimmy's fate on a whim. He's a caricature and a critique, sure, but not so much of capitalism as a philosophy, but rather as a system, at least in as much as it can impact power lunatic like him to make arbitrary decisions at random instead of doing what makes the most business sense, but on the other hand, the show wants us to recognize Bob as being the good guy versus the purely profit-driven Jimmy Pesto because he wants to make good, interesting burgers, or maybe just give them silly names, it's actually kind of amusingly unclear whether Bob is all that good at what he does, more than he wants to make money off it, though obviously he would like some money as well. At the same time, the show has very little patience for the busybodies of the opposite political stripe. The Michael Moore-esque anti-meat documentarian was both a bad guy and a charlatan. Hugo the health inspector is the ultimate caricature of a petty, big government stooge using his arbitrary regulatory power to bully the small businessman, and even though the Belchers are all a family of artists and dreamers to one degree or another, they frequently find themselves frustrated and shoved around by the high-minded yet impractical townspeople who often demonstrate a kind of Portlandia-esque narcissistic excess when it comes to showing off their own progressive righteousness. It's true that Bob fits in with Marshmallow and the girls better than he did at his dad's diner, but it's also true that he fits in there better than he did at the hipster food truck festival. This is all kind of difficult to figure out and hard to parse. The ratings are big on Roseanne, that means clearly there's something there that people want to watch, but does it have anything genuine to say about its supposed subject? That remains to be seen. People say they want a show that's representational about the struggles of working-class white people, but so far Roseanne is more about selling working-class white people a fantasy, the fantasy that their Trump voting relatives or Trump voters themselves are not really all that bad, or not as bad as they're being told they are, and what's getting in the way of the show's message is that Roseanne herself keeps jumping onto social media to remind everyone, no, at least I really am that bad. So exactly what the fate of this whole experiment is going to be is largely up to the audience and however long the studio can continue to stand working with a volatile main actress, which, once again, was what happened with the original show. But, as I've been saying on both ends of this, representation for this audience is out there, and I hope that audience knows they don't necessarily have to settle for this one version on this one show to find it. Hey gang, here's a question that keeps coming up. If your handle is Movie Bob, where are your movie reviews? Well, my old reviews are in a lot of places. You'll find many of them on my YouTube channel, but you'll find the brand new ones on Geek.com, an awesome site that's also your one-stop news source for science, TV, gaming, technology, nerd culture, the works. You can find all my reviews directly by going to Geek.com slash author slash B. Chipman, because that's my real name, and you can get regular updates on all my reviews and all of Geek.com's other great content by signing up for their kick-ass newsletter at subscribe.geek.com. 
And don't forget to also subscribe to the Geek.com YouTube channel, where you'll find the videos that accompany my reviews and tons of other great content, too. Remember, that's Geek.com, the Geek.com newsletter, and Geek.com on YouTube. Make sure you don't miss out on all the latest Movie Bob reviews. You can also check out my own new website, Movie Bob Central, where you'll find my blog, links to all my work, and shop for my books, ebooks, and future Movie Bob products. And please remember to like these videos, share them with all of your friends, and subscribe to this channel. Thank you for watching another Movie Bob production.